Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the New Paradigms for Transforming Healthcare, a double session where you'll hear two case studies in med tech and digital health. This is perhaps the most important session taking place here today. And I'm not just saying that because I'm standing here. I'm Boyle Jasper, managing partner of Finn Partners Jerusalem. We help Israeli companies communicate with the world through PR and marketing. Here in Israel, med tech used to play second fiddle to the more general high tech community. But it's clear now that med tech in Israel is a force on the global stage, with companies like EarlySense, Medaware, and others making an impact. And as time goes by, the Israeli med tech startups understand more and more the complicated systems around the world that they have to navigate. And as they understand that more and more, the real impact of Israeli med tech will be felt. A quick story. Every few months, our colleague Gil Bash, who's here today actually, our global health practice head, he joins us in Israel for a few days. Over the last almost four years of those visits, we've met with maybe 75 med tech startups. Now, Gil and I were both there in the first meetings back in 2015. And we were both there yesterday in Tel Aviv when we met with a bunch more. And I'm telling you, Israeli, Med tech is moving and maturing incredibly fast. Back then, we were spending those meetings explaining to founders that having a cool product was not enough to make an impact on the healthcare system. And now, in our meetings this week, we collaborated with startups and discussed with mutual levels of understanding the importance of addressing the five P's of the US healthcare system, for example providers, payers, policy makers, product innovators, and of course, the center of the entire universe, the patients, people like you and me. I find it incredibly inspiring to be part of this ecosystem, one that is located at a major intersection, innovation on one hand, and making a difference on the other. That intersection, our intersection, it's what inspires and motivates my team as we communicate on behalf of our med tech clients, and I hope it inspires all of you. In fact, we at Finn have a practice of using the make a difference hashtag on a regular basis when we post to social media. It serves as a reminder that the companies we represent are not simply innovating, but they're doing so to improve healthcare, to increase the focus on the patient, and of course, to save and extend lives. Given all of this, it's not only a privilege, but a major responsibility to be part of the Israel MedTech startup ecosystem. Some of us here in this room today are physicians, some are scientists, some are mathematicians, I'm certainly not. But someone like me, I'm just a communicator. But we all share one mission. And I thank everyone in the room today for sharing in that mission and the responsibility that comes with it to truly make a difference in the world. In fact, I encourage everyone today as you post to social media to go ahead and add the Make a Difference hashtag in addition to OC Summit 19, of course. I'd like to now introduce Alan Kamer, managing partner of Our Crowd Cure, who most certainly shares this mission and who absolutely is making a difference to kick off the session. Thank you very much. And thank you to Finn Partners for um, supporting us and sponsoring this session today. Um, I'm gonna call up each of our panelists one by one. First, uh, I'll, I'd like to invite Kathy Reed. Uh, Kathy, many of you saw on the plenary stage just a few moments ago, is the co-founder of the ICON Group. Uh, Australia's largest dedicated cancer provider and Singapore's largest provider of oncology services. ICON also has partnerships in China for radiation oncology and an integrated cancer center in New Zealand. Kathy is currently the digital advisor to the ICON board and she serves as chair of, of the AU Cloud 
providing, uh, provider of digital infrastructure and information governance for sovereign data assets. Please welcome Kathy. Next, I'd like to invite Gunter Hula. Gunter is a scientist, a physician, who specializes in internal medicine and intensive care. He's a professor at the University of Heidelberg. He's held various R&D leadership positions, both regionally, locally, and globally for a number of pharma companies. Uh, he was the lead of business development at Janssen EMEA, and now he presently heads uh, Janssen's uh, and Johnson & Johnson's J-Labs EMEA. Please welcome Gunter. And finally, I'd like to welcome Natalia Nakagama. Natalia is the, um, presently she serves as the senior manager of strategy and new business at Grupo Fleury in Brazil. She's held a number of positions in banking, consumer, and telecom, and previously worked at the Boston Consulting Group. And Natalie joins us today to talk about activities in Brazil. Welcome, everyone. So I would like to start by giving each of you an opportunity to make a case for why digital health startups should look to your market or to your region as they mature and launch their companies. Many startups that we see and many startups in the digital health ecosystem, their knee-jerk reaction is to build solutions locally and then immediately go to the US market. And I'd like each of you to make a case for why your market or region is an appropriate choice for those companies to enter. Thanks, Alan. So I guess speaking on behalf of the Australia Pacific region, there's incredible opportunities in our region at the moment, particularly for the provision of, for capturing data electronically. So APAC is currently pretty much an EMR free zone. The uptake of electronic medical records is incredibly different and at a much slower rate than what you'd see in the US market. So for startups whose solutions are around solving, I guess, the interoperability of EMR records, the um, the, the data analytics of the information contained in ER records, APAC is probably not for you at the moment because we don't have those large reserves of digitised data. However, if your solution is around actually capturing that data digitally and allowing clinicians and healthcare operators it, through the Australia Pacific region to be able to digitise their data and to glean all of the insights and benefits that come from doing that. It's an area that's incredibly opp opportunity rich at the moment and there's, uh, there's loads and loads of potential there. Thank you, Alan, for the introduction. And actually, I'm uh, heading JLEPS for Europe, Middle East, Africa, and uh, Russia, CIS, a super big region, super complex, but super rich in terms of innovation, entrepreneurship. And when we look at the centers of um, digital innovation, we are here in Israel. Israel is certainly a hotspot number one. But also when you look at Berlin, Paris, if you look at the London Triangle, the Swiss Triangle, the Belgium Triangle, Leuven University, they're super rich um, ecosystems in terms of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. But at the same time, it's super complex. So how can we make sure that we scale these, um, these opportunities internationally. And that's where um, the region is rich, but we need to make sure that we support these um, startups and these companies in scaling up internationally. And especially in Israel, it's uh, super important to not just reach from Israel to US, but uh, cover the entire ecosystem in the world. And I think that's where JLabs can play a role, because JLabs is, if we call it a JLabs at EMEA, is uh, the stage gate or the gate to uh, the global uh, JLabs community where we have access to all of the different markets and help companies to grow everywhere. Great, thank you. Natalia. <laughs> thank you. So I'm talking about Brazil. I thought about three main topics that I think it's important for you to know why you should come to Brazil. So first one, uh, Brazil, it's a big country, right? So we have 200 million people there. And 
uh, they are like really wanting products to, to, to buy. And maybe 10% of this population, it's the, uh, the population that we call a premium population. So they actually have a lot of money and they want to spend money. So it's a big market. Uh, second of all, uh, we, we have a lot of companies that want to partnership and want to co-develop with startups. So we, we are, uh, there is a topic, there is, it's not a new topic, but we have been discussing a lot that it's open innovation. So I have been talking with a lot of multinationals and also with Brazilian companies, and they all want to uh, partner and make things with startups. But uh, in Brazil, the startup evolution, it's really in the beginning. So we have some Brazilian startups, but we, re we, we see that we have a lot of inv investment available but we don't see that many startups to put the money. So there is a huge market there for you guys. And I think the last point is we are a country that we have a lot of problems and issues. And I heard a days before that Israel people, you guys really like to solve problems. And the topic, and the topic of this, this event today is I like, I, it's about global impact. So we have a lot of issues that we need to solve as a developing country. Great, thank you. So, Kathy, you, your company, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, China now, huge number of people, huge number of opportunities, very different healthcare systems. Talk to us a little bit about what companies should think about when they think of Asia Pacific and how to look at that entire region. So, I think the first, the first thing is to acknowledge that Asia Pacific is a region that has a huge number of very different, as you say, funding mechanisms. Uh, all of them are actually very different from the US healthcare system. So the funding drivers are different from different countries within the region, but the one thing that they all have in common is that they bear very, very little similarity to the US healthcare funding system. I think the thing that they all have in common, though, is the ability, the fact that they all are adopting mobile-first approaches. So what we're seeing across Asia in particular is mobile solutions are actually allowing countries to leapfrog the traditional infrastructure requirements. So we're seeing that with banking, with retail, with telecommunications. The infrastructure that the Western world has had for an extended period of time doesn't exist as these economies are growing and developing so quickly. But what the opportunity is, is to actually leapfrog that into a mobile first technology. And so applications for health that allow clinicians to communicate with patients, that allow patients to access healthcare information, all delivered via a mobile first approach, have huge potential in that market. So that would be something I'd really encourage people to focus on. Great, that's very interesting about uh, the leaps and bounds of mobile technology. Now, if a company wants to go to Europe and work with J Labs, how do they get involved? What's the process? What is it like to actually get started, help the audience understand the benefits of J Labs? Thanks, Alan. Um, the first uh, most important principle is that we apply a no strings attached policy. So uh, when we engage first with the companies, uh, we are not asking for confidential materials and we are not signing deals, we are not investing upfront. But of course, um, we want to identify companies that are on strategy for us, because the intent, of course, is to fuel our own innovation pipeline. So this is important as a, as a foundation. At the same time, when the companies um, uh, raise interest in JLabs, they submit a non-confidential deck, and we screen the deck, and then they move to a selection committee. What are the principles for an application? They need to be incorporated. So we are not a venturing platform, but we are an acceleration and incubation company, uh, uh, platform. So they need to be incorporated. They need to be financed uh, to pass the next milestones so that uh, they can really speed up the process when they get on board. They need to have a capable team. Sometimes we uh, help them to complement their team. And uh, as I mentioned, it needs to be on strategy. And then we move in through the process in a record time, I would say in uh, two to three weeks that they get feedback. So we have a global selection committee. And um, when I say it needs to be on strategy, people ask me, tell me what's on strategy. And uh, when you look at J&J, &J, j, &J is organized cross-sector. It's consumer, it's uh, medical device, and it's healthcare. And if you look at this uh, portfolio that we are looking for, it's, yes, it's biotech, but yes, it's digital, 
Yes, it's supply chain innovation. And to give you one example, freeze drying technology is uh, one of the key driver of cost of goods. And that's where we need the innovation. So how do they need to get into touch with us? Talk to me, send us your interest, and then we get feedback to you as fast as we can. And once a company is part of J-Labs, do they um, move on to commercial treatments within the Johnson & Johnson family? Or tell us a little bit about what's next as they go through that process. That's a brilliant question. It talks, also talks about what's the values that we deliver to these companies. Um, they get in and they just sign a rental agreement. It's a kind of a um, hot desk or even a desk, a solid office or even a lab space. We have currently, we are about to open the 13th um, solid J labs in Shanghai um, in summer this year. So companies can get in just with a hot desk, just with the virtual membership. And then we open up the, um, let's say, benefits of, of a big company like J&J. It's uh, first, they get access to our expertise. Uh, we call these people that serve these companies J-Pulse. It's a buddy, mentor, coach. And uh, each of the company is uh, getting a dedicated J-Pulse, one of the VPs, the senior executives in our organization. And they know um, how to connect these people internally and externally. They get access to our resource pool. It's resource that we use as J&J. &J. And last and third one is, uh, it's not the last one, but the third one is, they get access to our investors. And I'm sure there are sitting investors here in the audience that are part of our investors hub. And we ask these investors to join our investor hub to then meet with our um, uh, companies, with our portfolio, and we currently have 500 companies in our global portfolio, at least once a quarter. And we have programming, which is um, educational programs um, on GDPR or on IP management and so on, how to, how to overcome certain hurdles and how to become an expert. That's the, that's the benefits that we provide to these companies. And of course, we want to accelerate their growth. We want to help them to pass the inflection point to be more attractive to the investors. And um, that's, where, that's where these companies should move faster than market. Oh, very helpful and sounds like a, a lot of exciting opportunities. Uh, Natalia, Brazil, it's a, it's a puzzle to many people here. We get asked often, what's healthcare like there? So Grupo Fleury is one of the largest laboratories in Brazil. So explain to the audience how healthcare works in Brazil and then how Grupo Fleury looks to integrate startups into its activities. Okay, so I, I think we have two sides of healthcare in Brazil. We have the private healthcare uh, system and also the public healthcare system, and they are very different, right? So in Brazil, everybody has access to the public healthcare. Uh, you can go to uh, any hospital or do exams without paying anything. However, we have a huge issue there because usually, if you want to go to a gyne gynecologist or if you just want uh, antibiotics, you, have, you maybe have to stay in a line for six hours or maybe days waiting for, to, be, to be seen by a doctor. And in the other side, we have the private uh, healthcare system that usually people, they, they have their free will to do whatever they want, uh, basically, because we can either go to a physician that it's, it's registered in our insurance plan or can, we can either go to any doctor that we choose and then get the reimbursement. So we can see also that we have created uh, some bad incentives there because uh, me, for instance, I had a headache and then I go to the, P P the ER and this is like absurd, right? So in Brazil, we have this kind of culture that we go to either the PR or ER or the um, uh, specialist. So I, I don't have the figure of the family physician. Uh, which in the UK, I don't know if you guys are aware of how is the UK system, but every people in the population, they have to go to their family doctor that he knows your case, and this is the first barrier to an efficiency, efficient system. In Brazil, we don't have that, so we just go maybe in three dermatologists until we find one that we like, and this is a very not efficient system. So I said before, we have a lot of issues that we, we need to fix. And as far as Grupo Fleury, how do you evaluate startups before you decide to work with them? Um, yeah, right now, the innovation team, we are really focusing on uh, hardcore diagnosis technologies. 
So we have been uh, uh, working with a lot of startups and actually co-developing things with them. Uh, we noticed that the solutions that startups usually have, they don't, are, they don't have an 100% fit with what we need. So we have, we have actually to uh, partner with them and develop something. So recently, it's an interesting case for you guys. We participated on the Tech Emerge. It's a World Bank uh, kind of competition. And we have uh, selected three startups from all over the world to starting a partnership with them. And two of them, they, are, they were Israeli startups. One is ADOC. And the other one is Exceller, Exceller. <laughs> um, and the first one, we are actually deploying their product in Brazil uh, with, uh, with our products. And the second one, we are testing, we are doing a, like kinda, kind of a clinical trial with their product. So this is how we can partner. So usually uh, people think that big companies, they only have money to, to provide, but this is wrong. He, uh, in Group Fleury, we can see that we can give them uh, reputation, we can give them access to market, we can give them uh, knowledge. So we have a lot of experts and doctors that have like 20 years of experience and they can partner with the technology. And, and also, of course, we can be one of the purchasers of their products. Great, thank you. So, Kathy, as a successful entrepreneur, what advice would you have for startup companies, CEOs, as they look, they have a first version of a product, how do they decide where to take their solution? I think when they decide it, when, when you're looking at how you decide to, and where to, where's the best opportunity for your solution, one of the things that it's really important to think about is who actually has to actually change their behaviour to deliver the benefit of that solution? Because all forms of disruption actually require a behaviour change by someone. And if the person who has to change their behaviour doesn't actually receive any other benefit other than the feel-good factor of an improved outcome, that's not enough motivation to change the behaviour. So this is where it's important to understand what the funding models are of the market that you're looking to enter because you want the person whose behaviour is required to change to actually get some direct personal benefit, whether it be if it's a patient that needs to change their behaviour, their own health improvement. If it's a clinician, it needs to make their life easier. It needs to make their workflow better. It potentially needs to make their practice more profitable. But it's really important to understand who actually is required to deliver that behavioural change to achieve the benefit. Because if you're asking a doctor to take a process that currently takes him six steps and increase that to 20 steps just for the like of the greater good, doctors haven't got enough time in their lives to do that. So think about what your ask is and make sure that your product actually matches the behaviour change to the, to the recipient of the benefit. Can I comment on that question as well? Absolutely. Because I, I think what is essential in Europe is that people um, learn to sell their science. Um, it's a different when you, when you work with European startups compared to US startups. In Europe, selling your science, uh, pitching, excellence, these are major topics. And whereas we have brilliant science, we don't get it in front of the investors, we don't ex get the investors excited. That's also because of storytelling is not that, um, let's say, prominent in the education of entrepreneurs in Europe. I think that's very key. And how do young entrepreneurs get good at that if they don't have experience with that? How would you, many of the Israeli entrepreneurs, I'm sure, face some of those same challenges. So how do they get good and improve in that area? Well, the first one is training, 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 get good coaching and get exposure. So uh, whenever you have a startup um, first time pitching in front of an investor, make sure that they don't pitch in front of the key investor. Make sure that they have done some exercises first because they get in front of the key investor. Great, well, our time is up. We thank you very much, panelists. Thank you all for your contributions and we appreciate you. Okay. I guess I'll just have to speak loudly. I now want to introduce uh, Morris Lasser, who is uh, uh, also with our crowd. He's a medical venture partner 
with the firm. He's also making a difference in the world and he will handle the next part of the session. Hey, hey. One second. Everyone, thank you for coming. Oh, this one works, good. Thank you all for coming. Um, I have the pleasure today to introduce my team. We've been working together for a number of years. Um, we actually have a lot of fun doing it. I shouldn't say that too loud, because maybe they'll stop paying us. Um, but I'd like to, I'm not sure. Carry away. Uh, Dr. Maury Blumenfeld, Professor Chaim Lotan, Dr. Jonathan Wiesen, I'd like you to join me up here. And we're going to talk to you today about what it is that we do on the, on the medical technology team and uh, present to you some of our thoughts about how we uh, go about making investments, why we made the investments we made, and highlight some of the companies uh, that we've invested in. And without further ado, Professor Chaim Lotan can start to tell us about global health. Thank you, Maurice. It's a great pleasure to be here and thank for everyone for coming here. Actually, it's amazing on a daily basis when I looked at the changes that we had in the last two or three decades, it's amazing. I'm the director of the Heart Center at Hadassah. And when I started my fellowship, you can see we can only diagnose heart disease by looking at chest x-ray. If you had a big heart, it means that the heart is sick. That was the only thing that we could do. Here is Professor Gottsman, my mentor, when we got the first echo machine just to see that something is moving in the chest. And the new cath lab was a revolution for us, only being able to do some imaging. And yet, during a relatively short period of time, at the present, we can see our new cath lab here at the front, where we have a new horizons of bringing several images together. We can have what we call fusion imaging in which we bring the echo, the CT, the X-ray, all of them together. We can actually look into the heart, three-dimensional, see the valve moving, and this has helped us to do revolution. Where in the old time, if we wanted to do open valve surgery, we had to open the chest. To do today, we can do most of these things just by non-invasive, having this fusion imaging and the new technologies. And we do today replacement of valve, aortic valve replacement, mitral repair with clips and everything, non-interventional, non-invasively, without opening the chest. That's a revolution which our patients can live better and longer. But there is a problem. We can see that the population is aging. More than 45% of the patients have chronic conditions. Diabetes, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. A lot of those conditions are causing the fact that 80% of the health expenditure on the health are spent on those chronic diseases. And 88% of all prescriptions are going to this patient. So if we want to continue and be at the front line, del deliver the cutting edge treatment, we have to find a way to be creative in order to find ways to help the patient without this enormous financial burden. Luckily for us, in the last, as you've seen, years, technology is helping us. And especially in these countries and other countries where you have the advancement of technologies, where you have the advancement of the technology together with our human experience, together with the spirit of innovation that you have in Israel, especially thinking out of the box, trying to find better solution, we can see a lot of 
startups, and we see them on a weekly basis that are trying to bring together in the intersection of technology and human experience, trying to find those disruptive solutions which will help our patient to live better and longer in a quality of life. And as you can see... In Our new fund that's going to be uh, focused on medical technologies um, and hopefully will enable us to do more of what we've done to date. So, we'd like to start with the 24 different companies we've invested in until now. Uh, $78 million have been invested by our group, 24 companies. And what's amazing about these companies is that we started many of them at the design stage, at the conception stage, and we invested in them. For example, when Up and Right, as I said earlier, we saw them at the level of blueprints. It was just an idea with some drawings on a piece of paper. Um, many of these companies were at that same level, and we're pleased to see how well they're progressing. So when we look at surgical imaging in practice, one of the major areas of our investment, um, the investments that we've done to date, uh, the, 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 the revolution, the, the, the paradigm shift that's occurred in the, in the operating room has been in, in, immense. You're looking at a picture right now of a robot called the Da Vinci. And what I'd like for you to notice is how many arms, how big it is, how much room it takes. And what I'd like you to notice as well is that the surgeon sitting at a console and the patient sitting on the line would be lying on a table. They're not even connected. It's incredible what our technology is enabling us to do. And then we take it one step further. We can look at a company like RealView Imaging, where to date, you may be familiar with virtual reality goggles, where you're gonna to have to wear to see 3D uh, images, to be immersed in them, to have this virtual or augmented reality. And here with RealView Imaging, you essentially have it with a heads up display. And not only that, you can actually touch the image. And not only that, you can actually manipulate it. You can open it up in real time. If you have a catheter inside that heart, you can actually see the catheter in the heart. You can see exactly where it is, what vessels are being touched or not touched. If you want to do an ablation for atrial fibrillation, one of the difficulties is finding exactly where to cauterize inside the pulmonary artery. You can actually see yourself inside there by opening up the heart, by manipulating with your hands. An incredible technology and incredibly useful. If you're a surgeon, and you have these goggles on your head, it's not gonna take very long for you to get a headache. It's not gonna take very long for you to say, I'm done with this. Here, you have this hologram that you can touch and manipulate through a heads up display. Moving on to Mimic. If you saw previously the Da Vinci, which took up the entire room, the Mimic device, if you took this podium and flipped at 90 degrees, is the size of the Memic device. So it's not the size of a room. If you see how the arms move, they can essentially move in any direction. The Da Vinci and other robotic surgery technologies involve only one joint, the wrist. Memic actually has a wrist, an elbow, and a shoulder, which enables it to circle back on itself, to go forward, to go anywhere. Within a single incision, you can achieve any area within the abdomen 
where acid da Vinci is limited to only one quadrant per surgery. Another interesting story about Mimic is that the uh, person who designed it, who invented it, initially started as an inventor of the drones that was in the snake-like technology to get into buildings. And he took that technology and created a new surgical device that will probably be getting its FDA approval in the upcoming months. Another area we see a tremendous amount of involvement in is advanced biomaterials. So if you look at a company like Osseo, very often when you have a fracture, and, and Professor Lotan's wife unfortunately had an ankle fracture yesterday, probably had some plates and screws put in, eventually those plates and screws are gonna have to be taken out because they cause pain and they're uncomfortable. What would happen if you were able to put in a plate and a screw the same way you put in a plate and a screw today, no change in anything other than the materials you insert? And then what would, think about this, that these materials actually become part of the bone. They don't simply disappear. They don't simply cause a hole in the bone. They actually become bone themselves. You don't have to take those screws out. You don't have to take those plates out. Osseo recently received its first FDA approval on its device, uh, what was called a K-wire, that's used in minor surgeries and fractures in the hand and foot, and they're gonna be going into plates and screws as time goes on. <clears throat> I don't know if you saw Nanomedic on the main plenary. Um, she used Star Trek, I kind of used Spider-Man because that's what it looks like to me. You have this device, little gun, that enables burn victims or, or any chronic wound, as it were, to enable them to get sprayed on an artificial skin that you can see through, you can see what's going on underneath. The patient can take a shower within a day. So now imagine a burn victim can go take a shower after a single day. You never have to replace your bandage. You don't have to take it off and put it back on again. It doesn't have to be clean. The wound doesn't have to be cleaned again. One time, one application. And as the body heals, this transparent bandage simply falls away and new skin comes in underneath. Incredible news for uh, burn victims. We've also, we've also seen a number of fascinating companies in the field of artificial intelligence. Zebra Medical Imaging um, is one of the most exciting medical companies coming out of Israel today. We have on our team, Maury Blumenfeld, one of the physicists instrumental in developing the technology for CTs and MRI. Maury, could you ever have imagined when you were designing the technology 40 years ago that someday there would be technology that would allow us to process not one, but millions of images simultaneously. And that's what this computer uh, software allows us to do. Because they're static images, CTs, MRIs, X-rays are uh, very easy for computers to analyze. The, there's a global shortage of radiologists. There's a, a, a glut of imaging that needs to be analyzed. And this computer software can analyze almost any static image that the body processes in seconds. This is going to serve physicians, patients, and the healthcare system and create incredible good. And, uh, and we have the, the first, and now we have the, the end of the process of medical imaging. <laughs> the middle. <laughs> um, DreamEd also is, is an incredibly fascinating company where we've heard a lot uh, earlier uh, just a few moments ago about the need for software and, and digital health and what, what that means sometimes is being able to use software to replace the physician. And what the DreamEd software has been able to do is, is do exactly that for one of the hardest medical conditions to treat, which is type 1 diabetes. Now, type 1 diabetics lack insulin. And so one of the great revolutions in medicine about 80 years ago, 90 years ago, was, was the ability to provide them with that insulin, but titration has always been a problem. Now with this artificial intelligence and this software, it's been put into insulin pumps as a closed loop system, which feeds itself so that the patient never has to adjust anything. The patient never has to call their physician with questions because the pump knows exactly what's going to happen. The pump knows exactly how much insulin to give, and the pump knows exactly what each and every specific patient in a very personal way is going to require in terms of insulin requirements. 
If any of you know anyone with diabetes, particularly type one diabetes, you know what a challenge it is to manage and you know how this software is going to change their lives forever. So another area is drugs and drug delivery. Um, one of the hottest areas that you can think of today are medical cannabis, and I have a disclaimer. No, I don't have any free samples. No, you can't buy any from me. No, I don't use. No, I don't smoke. But the Psyche device actually is an amazing device that has a meter dose inhaler for cannabis. But the reason we invested in the, in the Psyche uh, device was not only for cannabis. It actually provides a solution for any respiratory drug. Uh, Jonathan's a pulmonologist and he can tell you that one of the major issues facing patients who have respiratory diseases is the lack of infiltration of the drug product into the lungs themselves. The Psyche device is a meter dose inhaler that not only controls the dosage of the, device, of the drug that you're getting or the cannabis that is being delivered, but it actually uses a, the body's reflex on breathing to induce a deep breath. As you take a breath, as you inhale, it actually stops the flow of air for a microsecond and then releases it. You can try it on yourself or your kids if you'd like, if you want to abuse them a little bit. Okay. You basically, if you take a deep breath, hold, stop the breath, the flow of air for a moment and then release. The first thing that happens is your body takes a deep breath and that ensures that all of the drug gets into the lung. See, what you have here is not only a delivery platform for cannabis, you have a delivery platform for any respiratory drug that you'd like to give to a patient uh, via the uh, pulmonary route. The technology that's based here, the physician can control the dosage, how many times a patient can get the drug, how many times he, can, he, he wants the drug, so the, patient, the physician actually knows how many times the patient is going after the drug. He can then adjust the dosage if the patient's not getting enough pain relief, if it's the case of cannabis. All of this is controlled via Wi-Fi. The physician controls this device from his computer. So you're looking at the melding of AI, you're looking at the melding of machine learning and all of this data coming to bear, not only in terms of what the patient is trying to do, how many times he wants to get treated, but the control of the medical device itself in conjunction with the physician and the patient. <clears throat> Alpha Tau, if you saw actually in the video, the, uh, the part where the scientist was using his little fingers to get out a uh, tube, that tube was actually radioactive substance. Today, Alpha Tau enables a physician, a radiation oncologist, to take little beads without any protection whatsoever. So he doesn't have to stand behind a lead uh, wall. He doesn't have to stand behind the thick glass. He doesn't have to don protective clothing. He can design specifically based on the size, location, and geometry of a tumor, these little beads that can go in by the physician, as I said, without any protection, and it destroys the tumor inside you. Now, what's amazing about this technology, and I was floored yesterday, Uzi Sofer, the CEO showed me results of a metastatic carcinoma that was present on one cheek and a metastasis that was on the other. They treated the right side. Within a month, this patient who was recommended to have her entire cheek removed was cured of the cancer on the right side. Then the question we ask what happened on the other side? The tumor was gone. And that's an effect called the outscopal effect. And basically what happens is the body learns via the death of the original tumor to attack the other tumor. So you're talking about a patient who should have had her cheek removed, is now totally normal, and has had her metastatic growth on the opposite side of her face that was not treated, essentially cured by the body as the result of the alpha tau experience. Then I think what, what is our favorite segment of this talk is the out of the box thinking. Technology that's emerged from good old fashioned Israeli chutzpah, taking a problem and not trying to address it in the way that people have approached it for years, but taking a revolutionary approach to how to treat, how to manage, and how to diagnose. One of our crowd's favorite companies is BrainQ, and because it's simply because, first of all, we've been with BrainQ since its infancy. Um, the founder, Dr. Yoram, walked into our office 
as a crazy scientist with an idea, and we've been with him since that day three years ago through the process of turning it into a medical device, performing clinical trials, and eventually being chosen by Google as one of the top four healthcare companies that's gonna revolutionize medicine with a six month grant to use all of their technologies in Palo Alto and access to their headquarters. This is a revolutionary um, combination of uh, digital health and therapeutics. They use artificial intelligence to analyze a patient's EEG signals. They can understand the frequency, the electro electromagnetic radiation unique to that specific patient, and then put them in what looks like just a little circle uh, on a little bed and use that frequency to, uh, to help neurological recovery. Patients who haven't moved their arms or legs or their paraplegic, quadriplegic for years are now all of a sudden recovering function and it's, it's incredible to see. And lastly, uh, I think you all saw Insight Tech, again, the technology pioneered by uh, Dr. Blumenfeld, the ability to use focused ultrasound to surgically treat without making a si single incision in the brain is one of the greatest medical uh, it, technologies to come out of Israel in the last 20 years. So. Thank you. Yes, we gotta do the next, uh, the next slide. Uh, and the next slide is basically our invitation to you to work with us in this new uh, major impact medical technology fund. Uh, I've been personally fortunate, as you've probably heard already a little bit, to be part of what I call four major innovations in medicine, CT, MRI, uh, image, what we call now image-guided therapy, and focused ultrasound. And I, I think this, is, uh, this has made a very big impression on me. I said it last year that uh, what really got me was when we first shipped, I think it was our fourth or fifth CT scanner, and then a few, this was in 1976 or 77, and uh, a few uh, weeks later, I got a, an, uh, it was not an email, it was a, re a regular letter from, uh, from the father of one of the patients who said to me, your machine has saved my son's life. And that was an amazing impact on me. And what I did is I took that letter and I posted it in the, uh, in, in the manufacturing section for the CT scanners. So I wanted to make sure that those people who uh, were working there knew that they were working on something different than just a GE refrigerator. They were working on something that was actually going to impact people's lives and make it, uh, make it something that they could feely, really feel good about. Now, uh, I've been very, very lucky. I can think of personally nothing more satisfying uh, than being uh, part of this revolution and now part of the ability to bring people into this revolution through our, uh, through our med tech fund. So I'm inviting you all to help us make an impact and join us in this med tech fund. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chaim. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Maury. Thank you for making the MedTech Fund possible. Thank you for making it fun to come to work in the morning. Thank you all for coming.